thinking about, but I want you to stop and think about all the things you've been thinking about during the time we've been in our worship service. So maybe for the past 20 minutes, what's been on your mind? Since the, since the, I don't know what's called the spirit, an air of distraction among us this morning. I just ask that you to stop for just a minute and think of that last song we just sang. It says, sin has left a stain, but Jesus has washed it white as snow. I don't know what we're thinking about, but that's where our focus ought to be. Amen? We're here for Christ this morning. And we're to think about Christ and to celebrate Christ. And as we turn to this text this morning, you know, it's a, it's a, this is an exciting text. Matthew's been in a very exciting book, and I want to thank you first. I didn't share my praise. I want to give you an opportunity to share yours, but my praise is a thank you for all of the words of affirmation. You know, during the sermon series on Nehemiah, I had a lot of affirmation that uh, that Nehemiah spoke to a lot of people, and, and then Matthew, it's been the same thing, and I appreciate that text on almost every other day, and lots of words of affirmation. That, that equip you is making an impact in people's lives, and I appreciate that. I'm glad to know that the discipleship ministry of our church is being effective in helping folks. This morning we turn to Matthew chapter 3, continuing in the baptism of Jesus. I mentioned last week that, that, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about Jesus' adult life, but it begins here. You know, it doesn't say a whole lot about the first part of his life. Tells us a little bit about his birth, but then it really jumps 30 years or so. Tells us, you know, what we know about it from his childhood is a, a flight to Exodus, a return to Nazareth. We learned in Luke that he grew in stature, you know, with, with men and with God. Uh, 30 years pass, and Jesus takes his first step towards his public ministry. You know, it's time for, for Christ to fulfill his purpose. Some people refer to this passage that we're going to study this morning as the coronation of the king, the crowning moment in Christ's life, the, 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 the moment where he, he, he began to uh, take over the kingdom that John the Baptist preached was coming. And here's what I know. When a king is crowned, it's a big event. It, it, it's, a, it's a pomp and circumstance and and, uh, you know, a large crowd gathers and dignitaries come. And I thought about the audience for Jesus' coronation, if that's what we'll call it. And it's, it's people, okay? The text tells us that when all the other people were being baptized, that's when Jesus was baptized. So he has a public audience. And, and, and John told us last week, or, or Matthew told us that John communicated with the, the Pharisees and the priests, so the publicans and the priests, they're there. So, uh, but you know, who, what is the most important element of the audience of Christ's baptism? We see it right here in this text. It's the Trinity. In the baptism of Jesus, we have the Father, the Spirit, and the Son all at work in this text. And as I read it, I want, I want you to grasp, and I'm going to explain, are three important actions associated with Jesus' baptism. And each action is carried out by a different element of the Trinity. We have the example of the Son, we have the empowerment of the Spirit, and the endorsement of the Father. Let's read the text, we'll have a word of prayer, and we'll discuss what we're talking about. Beginning in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. The text says John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and Jesus was baptized, and immediately up from the water, uh, and behold, the heavens were opened up, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son 
with whom I am well pleased. Father God, I thank you for our time this morning as we, we look at this text. The coronation of our king, the king of kings, uh, comes in onto the scene, taking his first step into our lives. And Lord, I pray that will you help us to learn the importance of, of what's taking place in this text and how it can transform our life, change our life. Help us to have a closer, more healthy walk with Christ this morning as we look at the baptism of Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. The text says, then Jesus came from Galilee to be baptized the example of the son. In this first text, Jesus is setting an example. Jesus came to John, the text says, specifically to be baptized. But the idea of, of Jesus being baptized by John was unthinkable. That's important stuff here. The text says that John said, I need to be baptized by you. Now think about this. You know, John knew Jesus very well. You know, they were cousins on their mother's side. Did you know that? John and Jesus were their cousins. So you know that they knew each other. They probably, the text doesn't tell us, but we can make some assumptions that their family, they probably had a few meals together. They probably played together. They probably grew together. Maybe they sat in the same rabbis and teachings and had, you know, family gatherings. They probably knew each other well. But John didn't just know Jesus' humanity. He knew him as the Savior. He knew his divine identity. John 1, 29, it says that when John saw Jesus coming toward the water, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He said, This is the one I've been telling you about. Now, here's the deal. John knew that why he was baptizing, right? He was baptizing repentant sinners. And so he knew that it was totally inappropriate for Jesus to come and be baptized. So he tried to prevent him. But Jesus is sinless. There's no reason for Jesus to be baptized, a repentant sinner's baptism. And the text says he tried to prevent it. And I want you to understand when it says that he tried to prevent it, he's just not saying, nah, let's not do this. This is an emphatic expression. It's written in the imperfect tense. It, it, this is an energetic action. He, he's trying to know Jesus, know Jesus. This is not the way this is supposed to happen. We can't do it this way. This is wrong. It reminds me, you know, I've, maybe I've told you a story, but my Wade, when, when we were trying to discipline Wade when he was a little cat kid, he, he wouldn't have conversations. He said, no, Daddy, no, Daddy, wait a minute, Daddy, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, Daddy. Very energetic. And this is exactly what John is saying to Jesus. This is not a casual conversation. John recognized something about Jesus before the rest of the world did. Jesus was sinless. There was absolutely no reason for Jesus to be baptized in a repentant sinner's baptism. He's sinless. So this begs the question for me, why did a sinless king need to be or want to be baptized? I thought about this and that this week. And the first conclusion I come to is above every other reason, Jesus' baptism by John was God's perfect plan. And while I'll explain the best I can to you this morning why John had to baptize Jesus and Jesus needed to be baptized, if you don't grasp that, realize, first of all, that it's God's perfect plan. It was bat Jesus was baptized by John because that's what the Father wanted John to do and Jesus to experience. We don't always understand God's plan. But it's always perfect. I talk to folks all the time, man, on a weekly basis, are struggling with life circumstance. I mean, I talk to people who I know know Christ, you know, and they're prayer warriors, 
and they're Bible readers, and they're God's will seekers, and they're doing the best they can, and they're following Christ, and they're living for Christ, and circumstances of life aren't always panning out the way they thought they would. They say, I thought this is what God wanted me to do. I thought that's what God wanted me to do, and I tried to do it, and things aren't working out. I don't understand. And sometimes all I can tell them is that we just don't always understand God's perfect plan. But here's the deal. John's out here in the middle of the water, hands up probably, maybe even pushing Jesus away. No, Jesus, I need to baptize you. You're divine. You're the Lamb of God. You need to baptize me. No, 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 no. That's the way I read the text. And then Jesus says, wait a minute, John. This has to be done for us to feel all right with God. This has to be done to carry out God's perfect plan. And in that moment, John stops the struggle. If that's what you say, Christ. If that's what you say, Jesus. Maybe, I doubt it, maybe he said, I hear you, cuz. <laughs> you know, we'll do it your way. We'll do it your way. Here's what I know. John didn't understand the plan, and he resisted. But he kept listening to the divine. And as the became plan became clear, the struggle stops, and he trusts, and he obeys. That's one lesson I learned from the baptism of Jesus. Another lesson I learned from the baptism of Jesus is that Jesus is baptized to identify with humanity. He's setting the picture for the people, man. He, he's making a connection. You understand? He's making a connection. Jesus came, according to Isaiah 53, 12, to be numbered with the transgressors, to be counted among the sinners. That's what that means. You know what I'm saying? to identify with humanity. The first step in his public ministry was an act, you get this, that would help all of humanity identify with him. He's doing the very thing that he wants people who will come to follow him to do. He's pick making the picture. He doesn't have sin to repent of, but he's making a picture. He, he's affirming a repentant sinner's baptism. And he who knew no sin took his place among those who knew no righteousness. And he went into the water and demonstrated a repentant sinner's, a believer's, we call it a believer's, baptism. Here's what I know, man. Jesus was a friend of sinners. He wasn't afraid to associate with sinners. He walked with sinners. He talked with sinners. He dined with sinners. He served alongside sinners. Guess what else he did? He prayed for sinners. He loved sinners. And he goes out into the water, and he's saying, Gee, John's been preaching to you a message of repentance. That means when you turn from your sin and turn toward righteousness. I affirm what John is preaching. You know what, you and I, you and I need to make sure we're always following Christ's example the example of the Son, to identify with sinners. You know, we should, we should be hard for us. We are sinners, right? And, and so as sinners, we, should, we shouldn't judge other sinners. We should love sinners. Set the example for sinners. Not ostracize sinners, but welcome sinners. Not welcome sin. We shouldn't welcome sin in our life any more than we welcome sin in others' lives. We shouldn't welcome it in others' lives any more than we welcome it in our lives. Too often, I think, that you and I try to judge the sins of other sinners when the sinner's sin that we need to be judging is a sin in our own self. You see what I'm saying? 
So Jesus sets the example by identifying with sinners. It's one of the greatest verses in all of Scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For our sakes he made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He identified with sinners. He also set an example to follow uh, for, for believers this, in this. Baptism is not something that is man-made. It's something that God commanded, something that he calls every Christ follower to do, and something he's told you and I, instructed you and I, to do among the nations. And Jesus sets the stage uh, for baptism at the beginning of his ministry. When he was baptized by John in the Jordan, he was not only demonstrated the practice of baptism, the affirmation, but the method. The method. You know, and that's one of the things that, as Southern Baptists, uh, that we build our doctrine around, is the believer's baptism by immersion. And here's exactly why. Maybe you ever wondered, maybe you've heard about pouring and sprinkling and baptizing of infants and all the other things that happen in other churches and say, why do we do it different? Because of Jesus' example. Jesus went to John because he was baptizing repentant. Get that? Repentant sinners. People who were old enough to recognize their sin, acknowledge their sin, and turn from it. Jesus was sinless, but he was affirming that re repentance is a prerequisite. You understand what I'm saying? Repentance comes before baptism. Now we know the method because the Greek word itself, baptizo, literally means to dip or submerge, submerse into. And Jesus wasn't, he wasn't sprinkled at the Jordan. John didn't take a little water up out of the Jordan in a bowl and pour it over his head. Jesus was submerged under the water at the Jordan. That's why we practice baptism. Now I want you to think about something here for just a minute. There's an order to this. First you repent of your sin, then you accept Christ of your sin, and then you follow Christ because he went to the Jordan first. You follow Christ in believers' baptism. Now here's what I know. A lot of people kind of get things out of order. They'll get baptized, and then so, as a child or sometime in life, and then they'll make a decision. You know what? I don't believe I was really saved when I made the decision to be baptized. I need to ask Christ into my life. This text just reminds us that there's an order. First you repent, then you believe, and then you're baptized. Baptism isn't salvific. It doesn't save you. It's not something you have to do on it repeatedly. You do it one time. Time. Now think about this. First we have the example of the Son. Next we have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3.16. Matthew 3, and when Jesus was baptized, listen to this, immediately he went up in the water, and behold, the heavens were opened up to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. First thing I want to teach you about this text is you take that verse right there in your New Testament and you circle the word or underline the word coming to rest. I want you to understand that when it talks about the Spirit uh, coming up on Jesus, Jesus didn't go out and obtain the Spirit for himself. This verb is written in the passive voice. He didn't obtain. He didn't do anything to earn the Spirit, gain the Spirit, or get the Spirit. The Spirit came by itself upon him. The Father sent the Spirit to him. So why did the Holy Spirit come upon Jesus? Because when Jesus was, became a man, listen, he didn't lose any of his divinity. When Jesus was born in, in, in a manger uh, over there in Bethlehem, he didn't cease to be God. He didn't cease to be creator. He didn't cease to be sustainer. He didn't cease to be any less than he already was. So he didn't need the power in the divine. But in his humanity, even he's born in that manger, the text says the word became flesh. 
the Word became flesh and dwelt among us in his humanity. Jesus was like every other human. You get that? Jesus was like every other human. Jesus became tired and hungry and sleepy. He felt emotion. He experienced pain. He grieved. He knew frustration, loneliness, and you know he knew rejection. So I was reading this week through the book of Hebrews. I came across Hebrews 4.15, and I was reminded that Jesus understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he does not sin. And I wonder about weaknesses. You know, I kind of kind of look at the words. I like to look at the words. And what does he mean by weaknesses? That temptation? He faced all the temptations. He knows my temptations. I look the word up. I mean, what are you talking about? Limitations. Jesus understands all of my limitations. That's a big word, man. That's a whole different thing than just one isolated idea. He understands my temptations. And he didn't sin. He understands all of my weaknesses, all of my limitations, all of my struggles, and he didn't sin. He understands all of my worries, all of my sorrows. Jesus, guess what, can relate to my humanity. As God, Jesus was all-powerful. But as human, Jesus needed a relationship with the Father and the power of the Spirit on him just like we do in order to grow and thrive and succeed in our humanity. So here's what I think we can learn from this scene. As Jesus was being baptized, his first act of public ministry, as Jesus was being baptized, so comes the, the first act of, uh, that we see where the Spirit of God's coming up on him to empower him for the ministry that lies ahead. Jesus is going to do experience of the roughest, you know, the last three years of his life were the hardest three years of his life. He never experienced more rejection, more pain, more struggle, probably no more, frust no more frustration you know, than he did the last three years of his life. And he needed the power of the Spirit on. I see it's a reminder that we need the power of the Spirit on our life. My worry is, my concern is, is that sometimes we've worked so hard getting cleaned up on the outside, you know what I'm saying, making, making ourselves look like we're believers and, and try to convince everybody else we're believers, but inside, we're powerless. We look good out here, but we're messed up in here. You see what I'm saying? So like when Hurricane Andrew hit in South Florida in 1992, there's a home of a woman named Norena. It was severely damaged, nearly wiped out. The structure was still there, you know, but everything else was, I mean, it was messed up. And power gone, you know, water in, you know, uh, trees down. And, you know, she got a little bit of an insurance settlement. And she hired a contractor. And he come in. He started doing some work. And they got the outside looking good and cleaned up. And they fixed up the walls. And, but they ran out of money before they were finished. Got nearly everything done except for, guess what, they forgot to do. It didn't do because they ran out of money. They didn't turn the electricity back on. So Norena's living in a house for 15 years. The yard's cleaned up, the outside's painted. You know, everything's looking pretty good on the outside. But on the inside, there's no hot shower. There's no air conditioning. There's no light to read by. Finally, somebody realizes that this woman's in a bad situation. They inform the city of Miami about her situation. The major or mayor arranged for an electrician. Just a few hours, they come back and they turn the power on. She's, it's hard to describe how it feels to have electricity. This is an overwhelming experience. Here's what I think. Many believers have a life that's like a half-constructed home. Power is almost within their grasp but they continue to live in dark day after day, year after year, experience after experience, cleaned up on the outside, but powerless on the inside, not connected with the power source. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, it says, he saw the Spirit of God 
descending like a dove, coming to rest. The power of God, the Spirit of God, coming to rest on him. You know, you and I can experience that same power. Acts 1-8 gives us the promise, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, okay? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You get that? You believe that? You hear that? And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth when the Holy Spirit brings its power on you. Here's what I know. Here's what I absolutely know. I'm fully confident by the word of God and my authority. Here is what I know. When you are saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. You receive every bit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in your life and he convicts you of sin and he calls you repentance and he leads you to Christ and he makes you new and he gives you a search of salvation. All at one time, you get all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to need. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. But here's what I know. You and I don't always access the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes instead of being filled with the Holy Spirit, we fill our lives with other things. Sometimes instead of being controlled by the Holy Spirit, we allow our lives to be controlled by other things. And Paul tells us that the key to living in the power of the Spirit is to, he says in Galatians 5, 16, he says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. So the obvious uh, question is, how do I connect with the Holy Spirit? How do I ex uh, experience, if I'm a believer, if I know Christ, how do I get the, all the power that the Holy Spirit has to offer? John the Baptist gives the most clearest answer. And he's not talking about the Holy Spirit, but he's talking about putting Christ first. And when you put Christ first and Christ has control and you're connected to Christ, you're going to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what he said? John 3, 30. You know what he said? Does anybody know what he said? He said, he must increase and I must decrease. Not just one time, you look at the language of the text, not just one time, but it's ongoing. I have to continually decrease. I have to continually to make myself less in order to make Christ more in my life. Let's read to you something from D.L. Moody. He said, I firmly believe that the moment our hearts are emptied of pride and selfishness and ambition and self-seeking and everything that is contrary to God's law, the Holy Ghost will come and fill every corner of our hearts. He says this, but if we're full of pride and conceit and ambition and self-seeking and pleasure and the world, there's no room for the Spirit of God. And I believe many a man is praying to God to fill him when he is full already of something else. How many of you this morning would like to experience the empowerment of the Holy Spirit on your life. He must increase. We, you, I must decrease. Connected with the Spirit. We have the example of the Son. We have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And finally, we have the endorsement of the Father. Matthew 3, 17, he said, and behold, a voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Who that voice is? That's the voice of the Father. Compared with Mark and Luke, Matthew's account presents something the others don't. Unique to Matthew's account is the Father's endorsement of the Son. It's the voice of the Father, of the one who is being baptized. He says, I am well pleased. 
need to understand something. I'm going to read a few verses to you. Make, make some quick notes. I'm going to read them quick. I'm looking at the clock. I'm going to read them quick. I want you to understand something. When Jesus took that first step into the river, he was taking his first step towards the cross. For Jesus Christ, this was the beginning of the end. It was him coming to fulfill the primary reason he came down from heaven to do, to save sinners. Think about Matthew 20, 28, Mark 10, 45. For the Son of Man came not to serve, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's taking the first step towards the purpose that he came. Luke 5, 31 and 32, and Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Of course, you know John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Hebrews 9, 11 and 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, though through, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands that is not of this creation, he entered once for all in the holy places by means of blood, of, not by the means of blood or of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. One of my favorite verses in all of the New Testament. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds. You are healed. He came to be the sacrifice, the payment for the sins of humanity. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, the Old Testament system of sacrifice, you know that for sacrifice to be acceptable, for it to be pleasing to God, it had to be pure and spotless and without blemish. Here's what I know, man. Animals are animals, right? And you're going to be hard-pressed to find a spotless, perfect animal. No Old Testament sacrifice, no matter how carefully selected, had ever truly been pleasing to God. Hebrews 10, 4 says, For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. 1 Peter 1, 19 says, But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. You see, when he said, This is my son with whom I am well pleased, he's not just saying, I'm happy in this act. I'm not as happy to see you baptized. He's saying, This is my son who I'm well pleased who will satisfy the sins uh, uh, that need to be paid. This is the ultimate sacrifice. This is why I'm well pleased. This is the one deeply, intimately, uh, ultimately satisfying to me. And here's what I know. Here's what I know. Jesus Christ is the payment for our sin well-pleasing to the Father. And I think you and I grasp that. But too often, we think we need to add to that sacrifice. I've been uh, reading a little bit lately about heart health, and cleaner eating, you know. I feel like my let myself go a little bit, need to get some things back into control. Think about my diet. I ran across this article the other day about eating cleaner and things you're putting in our body. And talk about additives. Additives. You know what additives, you know. The things that they put in food and add to products to make them stronger and last longer and look better, you know. And you know, additives are in everything like from gasoline to toothpaste to, to makeup, you know. And think about all the additives we put in our body. They're in preservatives and bread and cheese to make them resistant to mold growth. They're in food. Uh, coloring like to make margarine look more like butter. There are artificial sweeteners and soft drinks to make them calorie free. You know, we put all these additives into our body because we think that the additives into the things that we uh, uh, are consuming are making the things that we're consuming better. But you know, the article I'm reading talking about all the dangers 
of attitude. They cause allergies. You know what I'm saying? They increase the risk of cancer. Uh, and they trick the eye. Man. Okay. So hang on. What do you think about what I'm talking to you about? They cause allergies. That means they're disrupting our system. They increase the risk of cancer. They're making us sicker. They trick the eye. You know, they make things seem more enjoyable. Uh, but it's just really fake. It's really, they're making it look like something that it's not. And then one thing I've got this much better, replace the real ingredient. Okay, you see where I'm going with this? You, you, you with me? I think, man, sometimes we're trying to add things to our life, and all we're doing, we try to, when we cry, Jesus said, with the Son, I am well pleased, I'm satisfied. And if he, guess what? If God is satisfied, then, then shouldn't we be satisfied? If God says that Christ is enough, shouldn't we think Christ is enough? You know, we, I think about all the additives that we have in our life. I have Jesus, but I need money for security. I have Jesus, but I need to be, have my children around for me to be happy. I have Jesus, but I, you know, I need to have my, my work 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week to make me feel successful. I have Jesus, but I, have free, I need to have my friends to make me feel loved. I have Jesus but I still feel like i got to do some good works to make me feel like I'm pleasing to God. I need Jesus and some additives. Think about what the additives do to our body. They cause allergies. They irritate us because they're not compatible with what we're supposed to have. You know what I'm saying? They increase the risk of illness. They trick the eye. Make it more pleasing than what it really is. You know what things that they add to our life? They replace the real ingredient. You know what I'm saying? I think you're with me this morning. You and I need to take a hard look at the baptism of Jesus and what it says to us about our lives. Gives us the example of the Son. Not just, listen, not just, we don't just follow Christ's example in baptism. If your baptism's not right, you need to get that right. If your salvation's out of order, you need to be sure you're saved. But we follow Christ's example in all things. You know, text says there, he who loves him ought to walk in the way he did, right? You, if you, if you, you need to walk like Christ. It talks about the empowerment of the Spirit. It's no good to be all cleaned up on the outside, powerless on the inside. There could be some things today that you need to surrender over to Christ, things that he relates to, fully God, fully human. In his humanity, he relates to every single one of our struggles. He needed the relationship and the power of the Spirit, and so do you and I. Pour it out to him, decrease. Father said, the Son is pleasing. He satisfies me. If he's satisfying to the Father, he should be sufficient for us. Think about those things this morning. Father God, I thank you for our time together this morning.